Why don't we open up in prayer, and then we're going to um, study today's word and worship. So let's pray. Uh, Lord God, we thank you that uh, we can gather here today, be in this fellowship, here in Monrovia. Uh, thank you that my wife and son can join me. Uh, your word that gives us life, gives us in your way of seeing things, God. Let us today just draw closer to you and let us be with you as we spend this time um, studying your word. And let this week that's coming up, Lord, that um, we may live it with you, walking with you, God, in a relationship and a communion with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Not sure if they were done inside of that. This I won't run ahead of time, and then we have to wait a very long time. So why don't we um, get to today's word? We'll see um, today's message is how God transforms his children. Um, let's start off with Hebrews 4, 12. So four ways, four major ways that we'll see God use us to transform us. Um, so remember, when we first come to get saved, when we first tell Jesus, let's see this. You know, when we tell him, hey, we, we acknowledge that we need a Savior, we acknowledge we need salvation, we acknowledge we need, we need forgiveness. Uh, the process of, of, of God saving us is immediate. It's like it happens just like that. The minute we recognize and acknowledge your son died and that's what pays for my sins, what happens to us is we're justified. We're no longer guilty of any of the sins that, um, that we've committed or that we one day will commit. So that's justification. But right there begins a process where... That's called sanctification, where God wants to make you in the image of His Son. And we're going to see how the, the, the ways that God does that. How is it that God makes you more and more like Him and draws um, closer to Him? So that's what we'll be looking at today. So remember, the first thing that happens when we come to be saved is we're justified. Our slate gets cleaned up, and we are no longer guilty of the sin that we're in. That's why if, if you're saved and you die, you get to go to heaven, not because... We were good, or because we met certain requirements, but because Jesus met the requirements, He died, and then we placed our trust in Him and our faith in Him. Okay, but then God sees, looks down to us, and although we're justified, God wants to sanctify us and make us more like His Son, um, and transform our hearts, transform our lives from um, the deeds of our flesh. So let's look at how God would do that, and how He's done that throughout time. Um, Hebrews chapter four, verse twelve. We have it here. Um, I'll read it. It says, <clears throat> For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. So the first thing God uses to transform, to transform us, to make us more like a son, to sanctify us, is by using his word, through his word. By, by his word, we're able to see, it's not, we, we don't know what we're doing wrong, Unless we read it in scripture. So you can be doing a minute things. And unless you come across uh, a passage of scripture that's calling you on, on what you're doing. You're not going to know that, that, that it's wrong. Or you're not going to know what to do that pleases God. Unless you are in his word and you read it through there. So the first thing that God's going to use to transform us. To make us more like a son. To sanctify us. Is going to be through his word. Through studying his word. Through the, through the reading of his word. So um, we we'll see in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. God transformed something that was formless and empty by the power of His Word. So, in, in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I was supposed to include verse 2, but it says, And the, and the earth was without form, and it was empty. And, this, actually, let's go to it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. So, from the beginning, God's Word has been changing things to be what He wants it to be. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. I have it in Spanish. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So there you have it. It was empty, it was dark, and it was without form. And by the power of his word, look at verse 3. And God said, he said, it was, it was a word, 
um, that he spoke out of. It was a, 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 verse 3, God said, let there be light, and then there was light. So from the beginning, God has been transforming things with the power of his word. It's so vital. There's been so many times where, you know, I'm, I, I know that I'm probably living a certain way that I shouldn't be or doing something I shouldn't be, and going through his word, and God calls me out on it, it really pierces my heart, and it really calls me to say, hey, you need to be doing things differently. So, the first way that God does transformation in our lives is through his word. And he's done that since Genesis chapter 1, since the very beginning. His word is what created light. Verse number 2, second way that God uses to transform us, to, to shape us up, to make us more in the image of the Son, to sanctify us, is through trials, and I put quote-unquote, thorns in the flesh. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 and 10, we'll see the thorn in the flesh and... Verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the re revelations. This is Paul speaking and basically saying, look, I've been revealed a lot of things. I, I think I'm filling myself a lot right now because God has granted me to know things that are unknown. God has given me uh, visions, things that nobody's ever seen and that I've gotten to see. So, so that, that after saying that, he, he goes on into verse 7 and says, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. A thorn in the flesh was given to me. So in order for me not to think more of myself, God put a thorn in my flesh. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh is. The Bible doesn't specify it. But the message of, of why the thorn was there is clear to us. A, me a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I be exalted above measure. Verse 8. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might, be, that might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ and the result may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in, in reproaches and needs in persecutions in distress for, sake, for Christ's sakes. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God will use some circumstances in our lives. Uh, I mean, there's, there's endless stories I could talk about about how God uses tragedy in people's lives to call them to them. Uh, there's, there's, for example, I, I've told you guys about my brother, but there's some of the times where he's had a, a breakthrough with God or, or a, a recommitment to Christ is when he's gone through a tragedy, when he's gone through something that hurts him a lot, and, and God calls his attention to with that. So uh, just remember, the second way that God will use to, to make us more like his son, to shape us, to, to call our, direct, our, our attention, when maybe we're just ignoring God, maybe we don't we want to live apart from him, but one day we make a commitment to follow him, is through trial. Sometimes something's going to come to our lives where we're going to not understand necessarily why it's happening because it hurts so bad, but it's God's way of putting us back to Him, drawing us near to Him. And I know for a fact that I've, I've had it a few times where, you know, I'm, I'm living my life where God just down in the corner somewhere and He's being ignored. And it isn't until something hard happens that I'm redirected to Him. I'm saying, hey, I shouldn't be living my life away from Him. And this calls me to it. This, this reminds me of it. This trial, this thorn, this thing that I'm going through that's causing pain is what caused me to draw back to him. So, and remember, Acts chapter 9, if you go with me, Paul's conversion. The way that Paul was, who used to be known as Saul and used to persecute the church, the way he got called to Christ, the first thing that happened to, to him was that he became blind. And that was a trial in and of itself. Remember, so in, chapter, in Acts chapter 9, Come with me to Acts chapter 9. Paul is, uh, Saul, then becomes Paul, is on his way to persecute Christians, to arrest them. He has a letter from the governor um, and, and where it gives him authority to go arrest Christians. And, and a lot of times, he would not only arrest them, but a lot, of, a lot of them would be murdered. So he's on his way to do this. Again, he's away from God's plan. He's away, he's persecuting God's people, God's children, many children through Jesus Christ. He's persecuting them, so he's doing an evil deed, and this is how God's going to call his attention. If we read in, um, in chapter 9, But Saul, still breathing threats and murdered against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for the letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any, any belonging to the way, the way was what they called Christians back then, the way. They didn't know what to call it. it was going, they had to give it the name Christians, so they just called it the way. Um, read on. And men or women, he might, he might bring them down to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven 
shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 5, and he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. For rise and enter the city, and you will be told what, to, what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So he was blinded. He was blinded by this, this supernatural thing happens to him, where light shines. Jesus himself um, shines on him, and then he's blinded. So his transformation really started with the trial, started with him becoming blind. And now he's basically, not useless, but, but he's in trouble, he's in distress. And the people that were with him had to carry him to the house where God had a So, so every a lot of transformations have begun with a trial. So let's keep that in mind and, 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 and know that, that maybe not now, but maybe one day in your life, uh, for some odd reason, you uh, might go through a trial, and one of the first things you should ask yourself is, have I been, how is my communion with God? How have I been with Him? Um, and maybe that will lead you to the answer and say, hey, maybe this is happening to me because, you know, you know Maybe I'm not I'm walking away from God. I told you guys, uh, in 2007, my brother, uh, my older brother, Lester, uh, he, you know, he was just really, he was just getting into a lot of trouble. He had fresh out of high school, um, I mean, running with people he shouldn't have ran with and doing things he shouldn't have done. Anyways, he was getting into an excessive amount of trouble, and uh, in 2007, he gets into a fight, an altercation, and a fight breaks out, and then... Long story short, some people get stabbed and then he gets blamed for it, so he gets taken to jail. So he's away for eight months, and one of the things that that, that eight months taught him was it really, God really got his attention there. Um, and, you know, I, you know, we still talk about it to this day, and we're just like, dude, if, if he would have never gone to jail, maybe he would have been dead by now, because that's the amount of trouble that you were getting into. Um, so God will use a trial, even if it's going to hurt really bad, um, to draw you to him. A thorn in the flesh to just draw you to him. So, uh, Paul's conversion began with a trial. Number three. Number three. The third way that God will use to transform us, to make us more like the Son, again, to sanctify us, is by opening us up to God's sovereign work of transformation in all circumstances. So, God will give you in your heart the understanding to say, God is working in me right now. And, and if we read, um, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. I'll read it to you guys. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should be praying for, for as we or for we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So many times well, God's, God's literally gonna have to take over completely. Because sometimes we're not gonna be, we're not gonna have the strength. Or, or, or the mentality to, to make the right decision or to pray for the right thing. And literally, God will take over and pray. The Spirit of God will pray for us, on behalf of us, intercede for us. And what we really need, and a lot of times that's what I've learned, that a lot of times what I want is not what I need. And what I've needed is many times when God ends up giving to me. In every circumstance, in every area of my life. So, number three, and, and when you're going through the process of transformation, and that's the thing that happens forever, for the rest of our lives. We're going to get saved once. One time we're going to be justified, but we're going to be being transformed to the day that we die. We won't reach perfection on this earth, but God's mission is to make us more and more like His Son as far as we're alive. And that's going to be our lives for the rest of our lives. And Genesis knows, my wife knows that through this walk, though I am a minister, though I am, you know, I've been asked to speak many times, and, and, and I believe God has called me to it, but there's still a lot of things that God is shaping up. And, that, and I, I personally think that that's, I'm grateful for that, to know that God doesn't just save me and then leave me on my own. And here, figure it out that God is there constantly, even to the point where if I don't know what to pray for, the Spirit of God will intercede for me. I, I don't call that being a control a controller. I call that being compassionate towards me. Because imagine, it's like, it's like my son, right? Or yesterday, he was eating, um, he was trying to eat the wires that connect to his swing. And, and you know, it's just stuff that he does. He, he likes to put stuff in his mouth. And that's what he wanted. And then his mom came and grabbed the wires off him. And although he cried when she grabbed the wires off him, just imagine what would happen to him if he bit deep enough and he would get electrocuted in his mouth. 
I mean, you know what I mean? Like, Lucas doesn't realize that. And a lot of times that's how we behave. We don't realize that what we want and what we're aiming for is not necessarily going to be healthy for us. Although we don't know it. We, don't, we might not know it all the time. Like, Lucas, he didn't know yesterday that if he'd been deep enough, if the thing is plugged in, if it's plugged into an outlet that has hundreds of volts of, of electricity on it, and he bites the wire, and the wire shocks him, like, he could possibly die. And there was his mom just snatched it off him. He started crying and, and threw a little tantrum because he thought that that's what he needed. But that's not what he needed. He needed that to be out of his mouth, and then he could have a toy and bite it. But that's going to be our lives many times, you guys. In transformation, sometimes God is just going to have to do it for you. Sometimes God is just going to have to intervene in such a way where it's going to be like a supernatural intervention where even the Spirit of God will pay for you. So Peter experienced God's way of transformation after he denied Jesus three times. John chapter 21. If you would join me in John chapter 21. And in verse 1, so remember, just, just run up to the story. But before this, this chapter happens, Jesus had been arrested. And remember, Peter, Peter had promised Jesus that he would die with him or die for him. And the reality that what, what really ended up happening was the fact that Peter, when he saw that things got really serious, he started denying Jesus. I don't even know him. I don't even know him. And then, and then after that, he obviously he had to deal with guilt. He was feeling guilty because he had promised Jesus something. And then he had done something else. And a lot of times that's going to be our lives. We're going to promise God something. And because we're human beings, because, because of our flesh, because we're sinful by nature, we're going to end up doing something else. Something, our, our, our desires of the flesh are going to be more powerful than that that we promised. And then we're going to end up failing in our promises. And many times that would drive us to guilt. And that's what happened to Peter. He was feeling guilty. And he had decided to stop basically being a ministry. He stopped being a preacher. So he goes back to fishing. And in John chapter 21, here goes Jesus who, remember, Peter felt guilty that he denied Jesus. So he says, I'm no longer going to be a pastor. I'm no longer going to be an apostle. I'm just going to go back and do what I used to do, which was fishing. Because he felt shameful. He felt, he felt blamed to the point of, I'm not even good enough for this. And a lot of times, I ran into that as a Christian, as a Christian um, preacher, as a Christian minister. I ran into stuff like that, feelings like that, where, where I really want to follow God. I really want to make an impact on Him. I really want to teach God's Word. But then I, I have flaws in my life that make me feel really guilty and make me feel like, man, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. It's, it feels hypocritical. And I've had to deal with that. And although that, that, that was Peter's approach, Peter had basically given up, had, he had hung his gloves as a pastor or as, a, as an apostle, and he was going back to fishing. But here comes Jesus, and he had to intervene in such a way that the transformation had to be done. So verse chapter one, uh, chapter 21 of John, verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan, in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Verse 4, just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to hold it back, to, to hold it in, because of the quantity of the fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. Verse 9. When they got out of land, they saw that a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some fish and have just a catch. We're going to get down to the, to the bottom of it. So Simon Peter went aboard. On. Verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Verse 16. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Lastly, 
He said uh, the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know what I, that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Again, he had confronted him. Peter had walked away from ministry. He said, I'm not good for this. I denied Jesus three times when I had to promise something. And then Jesus has to come back, look for him, and restore him. And the question that he asked him is, do you love me? And Peter ends up saying three times, yes, I do love you. But the third time, he still tells him, you know everything. You know everything. You know what I needed. You know how I needed to be restored. And what that, what that meant was, Jesus, I, basically, you needed to intervene for me to realize what I did wrong. And number two, then Jesus gives him instructions and tells him, you're going to keep shepherding. And then he gives him, the, in, the last, in the next verse, in verse 18, he tells him exactly what he's going to do from now on. And he restores them that way. So he went from being an apostle to wanting to go back to fishing. And Jesus restoring him. He had to intervene in such a way. Lastly, guys, the way that God will, will, try, will, will cause transformation upon us or over us or in us is through the fellow, through fellow believers. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. And this is why the church is so important. Um, a lot of people just don't find the significance a lot of times of going to church week in and week out. And I'll tell you why it's important. Because of this verse. Verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, they grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ. Let's go back to Ephesians. because I don't, That doesn't cover it all. Ephesians chapter 4. It's so vital, guys, that we are constantly at church fellowship. And for this very reason, verse, go down to verse 14. Chapter 4. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitfulness. Verse 15, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head of Christ. Into, who is the head into Christ. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And that's how we have to have fellowship because, and, in, and the part of growth is many times we're going to have to tell one another, hey, the way that you're acting is not as we should be. You know, and say it in love, just say, hey, brother, if you're struggling, can I pray for you? Can I, can I ask God to help you out in, the time, in this time of struggle that you're going through? So those are the four ways that God will use to transform us, guys, to make us more like His son. And a couple of things that I get out of this is when I, especially when I speak to new believers, and, you know, I, I, we t Jen and I talk about this all the time, but, you know, seeing people be saved by, by, by the grace of God is, is the most wonderful thing. Um, it's great to see someone who was on a highway to hell um, suddenly get saved from it by the power of Jesus. But it's even better to see how God, through time, will transform somebody's life, will, will change it. Um, and that's one of the things that, as, as ministers, we, we have a hard time doing because sometimes we wish that, as soon, the minute that people get saved, that minute they will be like completely different. But that's not the case. A lot of times we're going to find that although people trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, um, the next week they're cursing. They're still doing things that they're not supposed to. And I don't freak out anymore. I used to freak out. But now I understand, like, God needs to work a process through people. And I promise you, once the Spirit of God is in us, the minute that we get saved, the Spirit of God comes to us. And we'll never be the same. And we'll never be able to sin and not feel bad about it. We'll never be able to do something and not be um, convicted by God's Spirit about what we did wrong. And that's the beauty of it. That's, that's, that's the beauty of, 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 of being a believer is the fact that God will not let you sink in your sin. He loves you way too much. He loves you way too much to allow you to just continue living a sinful life that ultimately can harm you. Um, and that's the beauty of sanctification and the beauty of, of being saved. Um, you know, and, and I think that that's one of the most important things for Christians to understand is that, yes, we're going to be saved at an instant, we're going to be justified at an instant, but it's going to take time for God to transform us, to make a, a, a change in us. And there's going to be years ahead of time where you're going to feel like, man, I feel like nothing's changing, but trust me, when you allow God to work, something's changing, you're really being transformed, and we need to trust that. So, why don't we um, come to the conclusion, draw to the conclusion, why don't we bow our heads? We're going to close our eyes. And I want you to just think of maybe there's some areas where God needs to transform, transform you. Maybe there's selfishness. Maybe there is um, impurity that you're dealing with. Maybe there's just rebelliousness. We go through it all as little people. I mean, 
I, you know, I'm 23 and I still go through some of these stages where I, I really need God to intervene and transform me and make a, a drastic change in me. Um, so why don't you think of something that God can be transforming right now? now? Why don't you tell him, God, here it is. Here's this area in my life that um, for some reason I have not been able to overcome. Maybe it's because I'm not going to your word. Maybe it's because I'm not allowing your spirit to intervene and, and, and to take a hold of me. Maybe I want to do things on my own and I want to try harder. But I've realized, God, that trying harder doesn't solve the problem. But trusting you more will. Allowing your work more will transform the problem. Maybe you're going to use one of my brothers and sisters in, in the fellowship that I'm in um, to tell me that, that something needs to change in my life because they've noticed something. God, whichever way it is, may, if we're the ones that have to tell someone, may we do it in love, may we do it with a lot of grace, being full of grace in, in our speech. Um, and God, I just pray that right now, as, as we're here, um, we give to you, Lord, the, the time that you deserve. And, and just here's our heart, God. As it is who we are, uh, we give it to you, Lord, and, and we pray that you may cause a transformation in us, that you may sanctify us. That you may change us in our lives, God. That we may be good examples to others that are non-believers. Um, so, God, be with us. Help us out. Encourage us. Strengthen us, God, in every area of the world we pray. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. And as usual, I think it's really early. Yeah, the offering and then we have to do